brothers and sisters, we are gathered here in this sacred place, in this solemn moment, to remember and celebrate the life of an extraordinary gentleman, judge, thespian, author, leader, and advocate, one whose activism was more than rhetoric, but brought about results, one whose lifespan what many are not able to do in three lifetimes. One who worked tirelessly to redeem the sight of the crucifixion of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. into the place where not only the memory of the movement is preserved, but a place where future generations of leaders, activists, and warriors are inspired to continue the fight of creating a world where we are not only and not judged by the color of our skin, by the content of our character. So it's right today to celebrate. Let's celebrate. We can celebrate by clapping our hands. For his life. We offer our prayers today for his wife, Adrian, for his sons, Justin and Mary, for his brother, Walter, and for their entire family. On July 12th, just a few days ago, Heaven's Supreme Court reached a decision on the case of the Honorable Judge Lonnie Baker. All three justices, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, reached a unanimous decision, and the opinion of the court was that he fought a good fight. He finished the course. of the court as it relates to Judge the Army Baby is well done. Thou good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things. Enter now into the joy of the Lord. So today as we celebrate his life, let's lift our voices in celebration and in song as we sing what has been called the Negro National Anthem. Lift every voice and sing. With the exception of the family, let's all stand and sing in celebration this great song of our movement.
Old Testament reading, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to 31. You will find these words recorded therein. As thou not known, as thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding, for he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no mind, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. The word of God for the people of God. Let the church say amen. Our New Testament reading will be read from John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 to verse number 7. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him. And have seen him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our God. Surround them, O oh God, with your peace and 
Shelby County, Tennessee, as well as the judges and chancellors of the entire 30th Judicial District, as well as the entire judicial community, share a, a deep sense of loss over the passing of our colleague, the Honorable Judge Jeremy Bailey. Judge Bailey came to the court in September of 1990, and he served as the judge of Division 8 Circuit Court where he served until 2009. He later returned in September of 2014, where he served in Division Three of Circuit Court until his passing. Now, while on the bench, Judge Bailey was an, an extraordinary judge with a very sharp legal mind, and on occasion, he was known to have a very sharp tongue when the situation required it. Now, he moved his docket very quickly Anybody who had a case in division either eight or three knew that if you set your case for trial, that Judge Bailey will set it very quickly, and on trial date, you need to be ready to try your case. Because Judge Bailey had a mantra on trial date, that is, no continuances. On that date, you either had to fish or cut bait. Judge Bailey did not tolerate delay. I think one of the reasons Judge Bailey was such an exceptional judge was because of the people he encountered along the way, who no doubt influenced him in some small way. Judge Bailey brought so much to the table that the rest of us just didn't have. You can find evidence of that if you ever go to his chambers, and even before you even get to his chambers, you would see on the wall, in the hallway, or in his jury room, letters, uh, pictures, memorabilia of people that he has encountered. Now, for instance, he met with some of the great judges, some of the great lawyers, and some of the lawmakers and thought leaders of the, of the, uh, of the time. For instance, if you go into his chambers, you might see a letter, a very personal letter sent to Judge Bailey 
from somebody such as uh, Ramsey Clark, the former Attorney General of the United States back in the 60s under the Johnson and Kennedy administration. If you look further, you might see on the wall or on his bookshelf a letter from the United States Supreme Court, Court Justice Clarence Thomas. If you look on his desk, you might see a DVD that has on his cover a picture of Judge Bailey along with uh, United States Supreme Court Justice Anthony Scalia where Judge Bailey was in a discussion, a panel discussion with uh, Anthony Scalia, Judge, Justice Scalia. And if you knew Judge Bailey, it wasn't a discussion. It had to be a debate. That was just him. You would also see, if you keep looking in his chambers, you will see a picture of Judge Bailey when he was a young man sitting at a long table in the White House. And at the end of the table was President Lyndon Bain Johnson. And yes, there was a picture also of Judge Bailey standing side by side with not President William Jefferson Clinton. It was just simply fascinating to go into his chambers and see all of these pictures and letters and other memorabilia. And just to look at a man who's had an extraordinary life, there's only one downside to going into Judge Bailey's chambers, though. Because when you left out, and you've looked at all that you've looked at that this man has experienced, then you have to go back to your own chambers. <laughs> and you look on your wall, you look on your bookshelf, and it makes you feel, how, how should I say this, inadequate. <laughs> Judge Bailey, through his experience and legal training, had what judges all aspire to acquire. And that is judicial wisdom. When Judge Bailey made a ruling, you can expect always for his decisions to be sound, just, and without question, fair. Yes, Judge Bailey brought a lot to the table and helped to make our judiciary great. And if I could have all of our judges, chancellors, as well as justices stand up just for a moment while I read this short statement. Today, our judiciary is diminished by the loss of a jurist who has presided over Divisions 8 and 3 with such distinction that makes all of us in the judicial community proud to call him colleague. Today, our sincere thoughts and prayers go out to the Bailey family. And we want you to know that we share in your loss. You may be seated. Now, before I sit down, I I need to, to tell you a personal, I need to say a word on the personal note. I've known Judge Bailey for over 30 years. I was in private with him, with his brother, Walter Bailey. When Judge Bailey went to the court, I stayed in practice with Walter Bailey, and then I got a job as a divorce referee where I worked in Judge Bailey's court. I later came on the bench, and Judge Bailey and I became colleagues. To say the very least, I got to know Judge Bailey very well, and I learned so much from him along the way. I also got to know his family. He has an amazing family, a very loving family, and they invited me and embraced me into their fold. So, Adrian, Justin, Merrick, and you too, Walter Bailey. I want to let you know something. I want you to know what I think of the Army Bailey. And what I think of the Army can be summed up in four words. I love that guy. So as the judiciary has lost a great leader and has been diminished by his loss. I want you to know today that my life also has been diminished by the loss of someone who's been in my life for 30 years, who I've called 
brother, mentor, and deep and dearest friend, the Honorable the Army Bailey. I'm very proud that Judge Bailey was my friend. I want to tell you how that came about. First, I want to say, as has already been said, that we gather here today to celebrate family, friends, colleagues, admirers, associates, not to mourn, not to mourn, because the Army Baby would never have tolerated that, but to celebrate. And to mourn would really dishonor the life that he lived. Justin Bailey said, his was a life well lived. He lived a life of purpose, of dedication to family, a life of principle, a life of vision, courage, and accomplishment. The songwriter who wrote the song, No Greater Love, must have had the love of the Army and Adrian in mind when he penned that song. Because there was no greater love than that that those two shared. The Army treasured his wife, his partner, his friend. He adored her and relished in that relationship. And she, in turn, reflected that love. If you talk to the Army, he wasn't going to talk to you long without talking about his family. He loved Justin, and he loved Mary. And he and Walter, of course, grew up as warriors. I don't know who influenced them more, but it was wonderful. For all of us here, if we think about it, the Army has left some part of himself in each of us. We in this community, we in the state, we in this nation, are a better people because the Army Bailey lived. Through his life's work, he cast a light on our historical past. He built a bridge and lighted and illuminated the path so that we might get to a better future. He well understood that a people who are uninformed of their past are ill-equipped to create a positive future. He understood that living is more than occupying space and breathing. It's about doing something, about being something. And just as he had a passion early in this life for fighting injustice, that passion was ignited in he and in Walter at that early age when they grew up in the segregated South. He ignited the passion in others, as evidenced by the leading role he played in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee where he trained and dispatched students, young lawyers, across the South to help in the fight for voter registration, desegregation of public institutions, and desegregation of schools. These young people were on the front lines in the fight for civil rights, for human rights, and equal justice under law. Three of those students were sent to Olive Branch, Mississippi, and they stayed in our home. And I marvel at the courage of those young people and their commitment fueled that commitment that they had through the training that they received fueled my desire to become a lawyer. I first met the Army Bailey when I was a student at the University of Memphis. I saw him, he was larger than life. He was addressing a capacity crowd on the unfinished agenda of the civil rights and the unfinished agenda of human rights. He was eloquent but mission focused. After listening to him, I was inspired and knew that I wanted to do something to make a difference. No one could talk to or listen to the Army Bailey and come away from that without wanting to do something. His family and my family became friends, and he honored me when he came back to the judiciary by inviting me to administer the oath of office. I thought that that was one of the highlights of my life, somebody that I had a lifelong love of and respect for. His life has been worthy of emulation on so many fronts, and he is admired 
by all who knew him, and many who didn't. Throughout his life, the Army took on difficult battles, unpopular causes, and oftentimes he took on things that appeared to be insurmountable tasks, such as acquiring a decaying Lorraine Motel and transforming that into a world-class civil rights museum. <coughs> his life was emblematic of the words of Robert Kennedy, who said that there are those who look at things the way they are and ask why. The Army Bailey looked at things and asked why not. What could this be? He never ran from a challenge. Instead, he met it head on. He conquered them and turned them into accomplishments and opportunities. He understood the meaning of courage, the price of courage, and he willingly accepted the risk and bore the consequences. As with Dr. King, Judge Dear Bailey understood that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. The Army Bailey stood steadfast and unmovable. He stood on truth and on principle. And he always willingly spoke truth to power. He was not one who would ask, can I, may I, or should I? Rather, his mantra was, I can, I will, I did. As a judge, the Army Bailey was a model worthy of emulation as a lawyer, an activist, an author, he was all, he excelled in all that he did. And he was always prepared, well organized, and as Judge Stokes said, unalterably committed to equal justice under law, without regard to the arbitrary characteristics of race, gender, class, or socioeconomic condition. He gave respect, and he demanded respect. He would cut to the chase and get right to the issue. His outsized, his outsized intellect allowed him to master the most complex issue and distill it to its core. And I know that all of us, in reflecting on Judge Bailey, have words that come to our mind when we think about him. But I want to share with you the words of two people that I think are appropriate on this case. One would be the words of Thurgood Marshall. He said that the legal system can force open doors and sometimes even knock down walls, but it cannot build bridges. That job belongs to you and to me. The Army accepted that job and built bridges that others might be able to march forward, walk forward to a better future. Thurgood Marshall also said, we will only attain freedom if we learn to appreciate what is different and must have the courage to discover what is fundamentally the same. Not he said, down the fences that divide us, tear apart the walls that imprison us, reach out, freedom lies just on the other side. The Army Bailey is moving on, or has moved on to that other side. The other words I want to leave you with are words that are, could have been written with the Army Bailey in mind. And these are the words of Steve Jobs, who said, your time is limited. So don't waste that time living somebody else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. That sums up the way the Army Daily lived his life. He lived it his way, on his terms, and we're all thankful that he did. Long live his legacy. May we always celebrate his contributions. The Army questioned the officer and asked him to explain how he could pick us out of all the other cars when he was over 700 feet away. Me, I just wanted to accept the ticket and go. But oh no, the judge insisted on knowing how the officer had honed in on us. And I'm standing there thinking, shut up, <laughs> and let him write the ticket as it was my tail that would be headed to jail. The officer respectfully invited us to the police car, taught us how the equipment worked, and I gladly accepted the ticket. He was alert. There were many nights when the four of us, Adrian, Dion, Trisha, and me, we played spirited games of big whist for hours. Suddenly we would notice that he had 
we had to remind the Army of the bid, the truck, and where the board stood. That's because he would fall asleep in the middle of a hand. So Trish and I would announce, we're going now. His eyes would pop open, and he would say, let's finish the game. He was responsible. My friend's word was his bond, though you have to remember that he was the consummate lawyer, so you had to better be sure that you were talking about the same thing. The Army's every breath, as I knew my friend, and no matter how controversial, had at its core making this life better for the least of us. His life speaks for itself on this issue. He was a man. When I think of the man, the Army, I'm reminded of a stanza in Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose with the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, you can feel the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. The Army was a man and will continue to be an aspirational role for us all. He lived to be the best son, brother, uncle, husband, father, friend, and humanitarian that any man could be. He shared his commitment to family and mankind in a thousand ways, speaking to different groups, and especially to children and young adults while challenging the status quo. He was man enough, as all of us know, to speak his mind. Personally, we differed during many private discussions, but it resulted always in both of us knowing and understanding each other better. As we say as Unitarian Universalists, you do not have to think alike to love alike. My friend was forever young. He loved to be out and about. One minute you might find him at a concert with loud music playing, sleep, <laughs> and in the next moment he's ready to move on to the next party. It's like he could revise, revive his energy level with such ease. I know this because I was often his date <laughs> when Adrian thought she needed to stay home or just did not want to be bothered with us. On several occasions, I would arrive at their home where he had been chilling, supposedly, and Adrian would say to me, where y'all going? I know he called you. And in fact, he had. And I can't say this because she might hear it, but I did the same thing, Tricia. <laughs> there was something going on, and he had to be in the mix. Above, I've added meanings to the letters in his name, D. Darren, A. Alert, R. Responsible, M. The Man, and Y. Young. But his name is not Darn, it is Dion. In fact, the, if the apostrophe is the most difficult part for me to talk about. In our, in our language, it can stand for omission and possessiveness. So that apostrophe takes on new meaning. I won't get the manhood, see him drop in on our family gatherings, or hear, hey, neighbor, my friend may not be physically present. I will miss him, but I possess in my heart cherished memories of our relationship. I'm Richard Glassman. I'm a trial lawyer. The Army was a trial lawyer in one of his lives. We fought and we became friends. How did the Army and I become such friends? I've often wondered, and his death has caused me to reflect. Reflect upon him as a father, as a friend, a husband, a lawyer the judge that he was. I now realize it was really very simple. We shared a passion, 
a love, a true respect for the law. The Army passion was not just a feeling. It was a call to action. The Army was passionate about a fundamental principle of the law, equality. Much of the work that he did during his lifetime was driven by that passion for equality. For the Army, passion was more than just enthusiasm or excitement, which it is to most of us. To the Army, passion was ambition that was put into action with all of his heart, mind, body, and soul. As a lawyer, as a judge, as a mentor, and as a friend. Your army showed those around him how to turn passion into action through his own example. This is by far the hardest closing argument I will ever give in my life. He was my friend. And he and I talked at great length when his mother passed and the family asked me to come and be with him at the hospital while they took care of the arrangements for his mother's death. And we talked about the past. The Army as a young man was passionate about equality under the law during the time when passion for equality could be dangerous. But he was not deterred. His passion and his actions contributed to changes in the law, changes in the world, made equality more than just a dream. It has become a reality. As the Army grew his legal career, his passions grew also. He gave his clients the best representation he could give. And he worked hard balancing his practice and his family growing family for which he had a huge passion. During his tenure on the bench, the Army's passion for the law continued to grow through his rulings and guidance to the lawyers and the parties in his courtroom. He always emphasized the importance of the law and the rights of all persons coming to, in, in, into his courtroom, young, old, white, black, experienced, not experienced. <coughs> He treated all parties fairly and equally. He counseled lawyers of all experience levels in an effort to improve a profession that he was so proud to be a part of. He and I certainly did not always agree. I think what may be clear is that if you ever talked to the Army for very long, you would have a discussion. <laughs> or sometimes we would call it an argument. <laughs> And we disagreed on the law and the interpretation of the law. But we both had a passion for what we knew was fair and right. The Army would exercise that passion the very last breath that he had to make sure that each of us exercised and had that right to speak what we felt we should speak. In 2012, in a speech at Vanderbilt Law School on their Martin Luther King Day, the Army stated the following. After the battlefield in Baton Rouge, as I'm growing and learning and engaged in this process of change, I am appreciating the dedication of these lawyers they weren't the ones on the marches. They weren't the ones that were surely going to jail. But they were the ones with the bold walk of strength and encouragement that kept us young people nourished and protected and feeling not alone as we faced these terrible obstacles. The Army further said, And so I have a tremendous understanding of lawyers, not as people who accept the law as it is, but who challenge the law force it to change. The sacrifices and the dedication of these lawyers, and sometimes it was a sacrifice of their own safety. 
close by saying a quote from Frederick Douglass. Power concedes nothing without demand. It never has and it never will. The Army truly believed those words. He believed in the power of lawyers to effect positive change, not just in their cases, but in their communities. And he lived his life guided by that principle, acting on his passion to improve the world around him. The Army had a favorite poet, Edward Markham. Edward Markham said it best, the greater thing is to fight life through. And say at the end, the dream is true. My friend, the Army, with his passion and his love for the law, made the dream come true.